1995, I started working for a nonprofit organization that was based in downtown Durham called North Carolina Public Allies. At that time, Che was three years old. I was living in Raleigh and my mother and my nephew were living with me. I was, I guess, 28 years old or so and learning so much about myself, learning so much about the world, making new friends and just really being opened up to developing a deeper analysis around social justice and liberation. It was an amazing time. It was also the time that my mother was pretty ill. She had been diagnosed with sarcoidosis and was very clear with me about the things that she wanted that would help her have a good quality of life without extending her life in a way that would make her unhappy or not feel in control of her body. And when you have an autoimmune disease, you don't feel in control of her body. So I wanted to respect her wishes and the things that she wanted to do to take care of herself. So a few years after her diagnosis and me beginning work in Durham, I made a decision that I wanted to move actually to Durham to be closer to work, to be closer to a community of people who would become my tribe eventually. And it was a hard decision to make, but it felt like the right decision at the time. I could not have foreseen that that decision would coincide with my mother's transition to the realm of the ancestors. I had turned 31, Che was six, and after a really disappointing experience in public schools in Wake County in kindergarten, if you can imagine that, we were seeking out an educational experience for Che that would really validate who he was as a black boy. And as I put out feelers and asked for recommendations, I was referred to Dolores Mama D. Eaton, who as a retired educator had decided to open her home to create an Afrocentric homeschool called St. Kofa Children's House. Ironically, I met Mama D. in my mother phase. She and my mother were born the same year, 1930. They're born under the same astrological sign, Cancer. So, so much of her vibration felt familiar to me. I met her and her husband, Herbert Eden, who we lovingly call Papa Herb. And we became more than just a family that was enrolled in Sankofa Children's House. We became family. So the same year that my mother made her transition, I acquired an, another mother. I call Mama D my other mother. She has also become a surrogate grandparent to Che and then Taj, as did Papa Herb. And she has been this constant example, reminder, this beautiful representation of a black woman who is unapologetic about being black, unapologetic about loving black folk, unapologetic about standing firm in her values and commitment around liberation for black people. She also is a huge example for me around a woman who would not be afraid to speak her mind and to stand on principle even when it wasn't popular or if that meant the consequences would mean loss of employment or friendships. And I also loved how much she stood on her values and commitment to the incredible radical black love that her and Papa Herb shared. So when I asked her if she would do me the honor of being my first Crone interview, she said, of course only, which made my heart feel so good. So it is with great pleasure that I introduce to you Crone Dolores Mama D. Eaton, who was born under the sign of cancer, who at almost 89 years old, she'll be 89 on June 30th, still drops bombs of truth and liberation everywhere that she goes. My name is Omi Shade Bernie Scott. This is the Black Girl's Guide to Surviving Menopause, introducing Dolores Mama D. Eaton. 
Welcome, welcome, Mama D, Dolores Eaton, to the very first episode ever of the Black Girl's Guide to Surviving Menopause. I'm really excited that you're here. Are you excited? I'm very excited, Omi, that you feel that there is something from my many years of being on this earth that will be valuable to black girls. I do. I think that what you're going to offer us and the conversation that we get to have will be important to black girls, black women, black mamas, black grandmamas, all of us. I'm very excited. So we're going to get started, okay? I'm ready. All right. So It gives me a feeling of imminent fulfillment. That's a perfect thing. I'm glad that it does. Well, let's start off just by talking about you. Why don't you tell us a little bit? about yourself, where you were born and and where you were raised? I was born in Montgomery, Alabama in 1930. And Montgomery was a city that is very much symbolic of living under apartheid. There were no physical barriers but we knew exactly how far we were, quote unquote, allowed to go. And we knew that we were contained in a defined geographical area. But we got so much love and support from the people in my community that as a young person from as far back as I can remember, I was never conscious of a great deal of negativity. I only knew love and affirmation. And I was made to feel that I could achieve whatever I aspired to achieve. Can you tell me a little bit more about your family? My mom and dad, of course, had a tremendous positive impact on my life. My father was orphaned when he was in his preteens. He was raised by his older sister. He was very bright, as was affirmed by a high school teacher that I knew who said she saw a lot of promise in him. And of course, He had to resist the suppression of the racist supremacy system. But even in having to overcome the suppression of the white supremacy system, he achieved. Uh, As a young black man, he graduated high school. He was a reader. What year was your father born? My father was born in... 1908. That's a big deal for him to graduate Mm -hmm. from high school. Yes. Well, my mother graduated college Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in 1928. What year was your mom born? My mom was born in 1906. Oh, so she was a little bit older than your dad. Yes. All right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. (laughs) That's cool. Yeah. And were you raised with your grandmothers or your grandparents? I did not know my paternal grandparents, Mm -hmm. because as I said, Mm -hmm. my father was orphaned, but I knew my my mother's parents. My mother's father passed when I was, must have been about four years old, Mm -hmm. so that's my memory of him. My maternal grandmother, however, came to live with us. She was widowed, and she'd only had two children, two girls. And my mother's younger sister passed in childbirth. Mm. So my maternal grandmother came to live in our home, Mm -hmm. my mother's Mm -hmm. home, and my father. How old was your grandmother when when she passed? When my maternal grandmother passed... She was in her 60s. Hmm. Okay. 
true. They tend to be long, tended to be long livers. Mm -hmm. Mm Because I remember meeting your mom when Che started Sankofa Children's House. And I think your mom was in her late 90s when I met her. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, she was. Because she made the transition shortly after her 106th birthday. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, I remember that. You had a good memory. I remember that because when we would come into the house, we would always stop in the first room. Yes. And give her a hug and a kiss. Yes. And she would, you know, where's my sugar? Give me, give me a hug. I remember that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's, that's a beautiful memory. Do you ever recall, I don't know, as you were getting older, moving into your teenage years, do you recall your mom or your grandmother or older women in your community having conversations with you about preparing for like your first period or your first cycle? You know, the women in my community, including my mother and grandmother, tended to treat the menstrual cycle like something mystical Mm -hmm. or something connected to the need for young girls to be protected. Mm. So I wasn't very enlightened about a menstrual period. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No. How did they respond when you first started your, your cycle? If they kind of thought about it as this thing that would, that you needed to be protected um, once it arrived? I don't think they perceived it in that way. Mm-hmm. It was that, I was changing and I was becoming a woman. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, it was obvious that the elders, both the male and female elders, needed to protect me. Mm -hmm. And I later understood that what they felt they needed to protect me from was an unwanted pregnancy. Got it. Okay. Okay. So... Was there any sex talk around, listen, Dolores, here are the things that are happening with your body, or Dolores, you are now in a different place, and this is the thing that you can do to keep yourself safe? Absolutely no conversation about that. Now, it appeared as though young fellows were attracted to me, Mm -hmm. but it also was obvious that my folk were determined to protect me there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I never shall forget on one occasion, I must have been about about 13 or 14, my early teens. Mm-hmm. There was a young fellow named King Boykins. King Boykins. Mm-hmm. All right. And I, I couldn't court, mm-hmm. but on Christmas Day, he came to my house and brought a gift. It was a compact. That was a common gift for young women at that time. Mm-hmm. A compact mirror? A com yeah, the compact uh. opened it held powder. Okay. And a powder puff. So okay. you could could powder make up nose. and look pretty. Okay. It was blue. I haven't forgotten that. And my mom came to the door while he was there and I had opened it. I didn't invite him in because we didn't receive male company. And she said, well, it's very nice to think about her. She said, but you can't keep that. Mm. You have to return it. Mm -hmm. So I had to give it back to Mm -hmm. him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. That's interesting. I've never forgotten it. I I, I see King Boy can stay in your mind. (laughs) Yeah, I couldn't make sense of it. Interesting. Because since I didn't get those early talks Mm -hmm. about the onset of the menstrual period and I was maturing and I could become pregnant. I thought it was a very sweet and innocent thing to do, and I didn't get beyond that. Mm. But she said, no, you have to give it back. You have to give it back. Did you have conversations with your girlfriends as you got into high school about relationships or, you know, boys or just becoming really clear more about going into your womanhood before you started college? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. In high school. Mm -hmm. We did most of our talk about boys and having a boyfriend in high school. 